Tactical Games with tweets from a guest speaker who is in Singapore for what, a couple of weeks? Yeah. yeah. Right. So let's start with Abel, and then we'll have a second one after about, uh, um, with uh, Lucas talking about, uh, what was it? Quick check. Uh, quick check, yes. Uh, the, the only one quick announcement is I won't be around till the end of the meetup. I have to rush up halfway through, but a friend of mine will be uh, sort of helping to clear up after. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask Mike, uh, about Hackerspace, sorry. Feel free to ask Mike, uh, his, his uh, member as well, or any of the other Hackerspace members. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you guys next month. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, so my name is Abel. I'm going to be talking about uh, some work that some people did where they try uh, to predict the outcomes of uh, NFL games using uh, data from Twitter. Uh, my English is not that great. I mean, uh, it's kind of accented. So if there is anything you don't understand, please like, don't be afraid to ask for repetition. If you don't understand, probably most people don't either. So we're doing them a, a favor. And uh, I don't remember talking in public for like one year or two. So this might suck a lot. Uh, I, I hope. I hope it doesn't. It's uh, a good time. Uh, also, uh, as I was reading the paper again on my way to Singapore, it kind of turned a bit into like a papers we hate presentation. <laughs> but, uh, that happens quite often, actually. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, it's still uh, a good time for everyone. So, uh, first thing is so NFL is an American football league. Here, I usually make some kind of European smack comment, but I'm gonna <laughs> be nice. So, this is a sport. Uh, uh, things you need to understand to kind of follow the rest. Basically, there are two teams on every game. So one of the teams is the home team, which is the one that has the stadium. You know, they, they control the stadium or they, they play there half of their games. And the other one is the away team, who is uh, visiting. So that's a good thing to know. And then the teams get points. Whoever gets the most points wins. And it's a weekly schedule. So you have a bunch of games that are playing on like uh, week one, and then you have another bunch of games that are playing on week two, and so on. So that's, that's pretty much everything you need to know to understand what this, uh, the analysis that these people did. And um, something that may be good to, to, to have in mind as well is that there is a ball, and if the ball goes in one direction, that means one team is like more likely to get points, and if it goes in the opposite direction, it's the other way around. So that's kind of good knowledge to have as well. That's, that's it. So, uh, also, I forgot to say this, but if you have any questions, like, feel free to interrupt. Uh, I don't have that many slides, so it's not like it's going to go over time or anything if you ask questions, so feel free to do that. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a bit about the kind of predictions that these people make. Uh, basically, at the end of the game, you have a score, and there are several kind of things that you can try to predict against it, about the score. So the first one is the winner. So just which of the teams has more points in that score. So that's, that's an easy one. Another one that's kind of like more subtle is a prediction about a 50-50 spread. So basically. Some people don't like to make predictions about winners because I can I can get winners right most of the time if I just say that the home team is going to win because home teams win most of the games. Um, some people would rather make predictions about things that are a 50-50 split. I think the reasons have to do with variance, but I don't really understand them, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that happens. So. What happens instead is that the people that accept the predictions, which are usually like casinos or bookmakers or websites that people do for these things, uh, they set a spread. What that means is that they say, okay, we have a team that's the favorite, and then they ask these questions. Is, what's the ch using some internal model, what's the chance that the favorite is going to win by one point or more? What's the chance that the favorite is going to win by two points or more? What's the chance that the favorite is going to win by three points or more, and so on and so on. If you keep asking the questions, those chances get closer to 50%. So you pick the question that's 
closer to a 50-50 split. And, uh, and that's the spread question. So basically, making a prediction about the spread uh, is giving an answer to a question that looks like that. Is the home team going to win by three points at least? Um, that three is the, is the spread. That's what people call the spread is that number uh, that's associated with the question. So uh, uh, is this more or less clear, or should so I? So you're saying that uh, that's the number. So three, if you say the square of three, then three is the number where you re don't know if it's a, it's it a different chance. For, for one of the teams, yes. Yeah. So saying that the favorite team will win by that number of points or more yeah. is a 50, 50 proposition, yeah. And that's people call that the spread. And then uh, the, the third one is over-under, which is a prediction about the total number of points that are going to be scored in the game. So similarly speaking, there is a model that the bookmaker or casino or whatever has. And then they determine which one is the 50-50 point, such that asking, is there going to be more than 200 points, is a 50-50 proposition. So. Um, so those are the three kinds of predictions that we are uh, that we are considering. So now uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the information that the the people in this paper used to predict the games. So it's not just tweets. If you just use tweets, it's, it's not that great. They, in many cases, so you need to use other things. Uh, I don't know if they started doing that at the beginning of the paper or did some experiments and realized that tweets are kind of shit sometimes and they got over. I don't know how it happened, but the point is they actually use quite a bit of other things. So uh, the things that they use is uh, the first one is just the frequency of, uh, of words in tweets. So for each word, if that word appears on a lot of the tweets, that people make about a game, the the percentage of tweets in which that word occurs is something that they is something that they use. So basically, uh, if everyone is tweeting uh, about a team that's playing a game, the word injury that probably means they're going to do worse. Uh, and if it's an offensive player, that may mean they are going to score uh, less points. So it may be useful information for a. Uh, making a prediction on the over-under. So that's an example of how could that be, be useful. Something else that they use as kind of a smart is a change in tweet volumes. So how much are people tweeting about the game? I guess you could say, uh, to, to give some intuition, that maybe if the fans are not tweeting much about their team, that may mean they're not very motivated, and the team might do worse than expected. So that's, that might be a possible way of causation. Uh, also something that they use is the actual dose spread and over under 50-50 margins we've been talking about before. Uh, an obvious way in which this is useful is if the spread is that asking you is the favorite going to win, is the home team going to win by five points or more, then you can use that to make a prediction about the winner and say that the winner is going to be the home team because that's implicit by getting us the, the question about the spread. And, uh, and also, of course, they use some statistics of teams' performance, like maybe they have been, maybe both of the teams have been scoring a lot of points lately. So maybe that means, you know, the, the over-under might be more likely to be over than under. So it's just that kind of information. Um, so I'll, a little bit more about the details of how they get that data. Yeah. Often, I think, with that kind of project, the hardest part for actually doing it, it's actually getting the data. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if they spend most of the time just getting the data, and then they run the analysis in like one hour. Mm -hmm. uh, that wouldn't, that wouldn't do six months. So, the tweets they get from the Twitter Garden Hose API, I don't know if that's open or not anymore, but yeah. that gives you like 10% uh, of the tweets that, that people make. Uh, to associate the tweets with a particular team that's playing on a game, to see which game it is, you just look at which week it is. So basically, it's the next game that's going to happen. And then uh, to see if it's one thing or the other, 
the use hashtags. So if it has the hashtag for more than one team, they just ignore it. If it has hashtag that they they manually uh, see which hashtags correspond to which teams, then they associate it with the team that the hashtag says it should be associated with. And uh, pretty much uh, everything else is from uh, the website, nfldata.com. They also collect some information uh, about the spread lines that the casinos are setting. That's where they take it from as well, from that website. So as a science study, something that they do that's kind of cool is they look at uh, which words appear on tweets after games are played, depending on what the outcome of the game is. Uh, the coolest thing that they find is that um, when the VC team team loses, people complain about the referees. They have the word refs. But when the home team is the one that loses, they don't complain about it's not so significant that they care about the refs. And that's actually kind of correlated with something I mentioned before, <coughs> which is that home teams will win most of the games. People have studied why is this the case. And the consensus answer from, from several studies, uh, I'm under the impression that in most sports, uh, home teams are the ones that win most of the games because the referees favor them. Uh, subconsciously, you, you could say that it's just because the crowd is there and uh, yelling you to something, something you're more likely to do that. You don't want to go against the crowd. So it does make sense that when the, that when the visiting team loses, they complain about the refs since it's more or less proven that the refs are going against them than when the home team loses. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, it's a little section that they have in the paper. And uh, so now before you put that data um, mm -hmm. that, they, that they collect in that way in the, in the prediction model, <coughs> there is some data massage that you have to do. So basically, uh, it's too much to have a feature in your model, to have a variable for every word that appears in all tweets that anyone has made about that team. So they just take words that appear in a fixed percentage of the, of the tweets. That's a little thing that they do. And something else that they need to do, is <coughs> kind of messy as well, but basically they do some predictions where they use as variables both those frequencies of war in the tweets and some information about the performances of the teams. There are, I haven't looked at it, but I would expect that there are like tens of thousands or like thousands of variables corresponding to the frequencies of particular war and the performance of the teams are just using like 20 words. So if you, sure, if you like just mix those like tens of thousands of variables about frequency of the words with the ones about the team statistical performance, which are very few. Basically, your model is pretty much just going to ignore the ones about the performance of the teams. Uh, they're just going to get drawn by the other 20,000 uh, variables. So then what you need to do is to combine those 20,000 variables into a, a few uh, that are in the same order of magnitude as the ones about the the teams uh, the teams skills. So basically, what they do is that they consider word frequency for a particular game as a vector. So if the first word uh, in some fixed order uh, appears in 20% of the tweets and the second one appears in 10% of the tweets the vector is going to begin like 20, 10, uh, something. And then they use a linear map to reduce that vector to a smaller dimensional vector. And then each of the components of that vector are the new variables. Is that more or less clear? Or should I repeat? Or is that? Okay. And uh, that's another trick that they, that they need to use. And then something else that they do is that to look at the, those changes in volume of tweets that we've been talking about, 
you can look at those changes of absolute quantities like what, there were 1,000 tweets less about this thing this week. Or you can look at it as a, as a relative thing. There was a 5% decrease. So I don't think it's clear which one to use. So they use both uh, in, different, in different situations. So the next thing uh, to, to mention is uh, which, uh, which algorithm do they use? Um, to make those predictions. So it's a logistic regression classifier. So basically, uh, that's what a logistic function is, is like. Um, for every variable, uh, that's more or less simulating a, a threshold function. And basically, what, what, you are, what, your, uh, what your model training algorithm is doing is associating a weight with each variable and a threshold. And then, if the value of the variable for a given game is about the threshold, you add the weight uh, to the your estimate of of, of the outcomes. And uh, of course, it's not exactly that because it's a little bit more smooth. But that's basically what what it's about. Um, so. Oh, basically, in in this case, the x uh, the x axis is um, any of the variables that we talk about. So it could be the frequency of a particular war in the tweets that are made about the game. So the frequency of the war attack in tweets about the game, and then the y axis. So basically, what you're doing here is you are. Uh, you're fixing one of the outcomes of the prediction. So you're saying arbitrarily that you're trying to see what's the probability that the over-under is over. You could do it with under instead. And basically, for each variable in your model, you have a curve like that. The y value is how much probability you add to your estimate that the outcome is over based on that variable. So as the vari and of course, this could be symmetrical. Um, this could, instead of going from 0 to 1, this could go from 1 to 0. And you have a weight for each variable. So it doesn't, have from, it doesn't go from 0 to 1. It goes from 0 to the weight. Um, but basically, you're just going to have a curve like that for every variable. And then you're going to go, when you're making a prediction for the game, for each variable, you will go to this graph. You're going to see what's the y value corresponding to the value of that variable. Or you're going to add that to what you think are the chances that the outcome of the game will be uh, over in the over under case. So why is this the probability? Sorry? Yeah, that's the that's probability. Yeah. You're basically trying to find out which variables are more important than other ones. Yeah, exactly, because the, the variables that are more important are going to have a larger weight. So the variables that are more important, yeah. when you do that process, the value that you're going to get is going to go from 0 to maybe like 0 0.1. So the curve will shift it? Mm, well, the curve is also going to be shifted, but I'm talking about something different. I mean, I'm talking about a vertical scale rather than a, a step. Just a step. Uh, the size of the step, yes. The step will go from 0 to 0 0.001 if it's a variable you don't care about. Because that variable doesn't impact your prediction. If it's a variable you care about, the curve will go from 0 to like 0 0.1, because it accounts for 10% of the from 10 of the answer. So do they run the model, and then for the first time they run it, they don't put that one variable in. Second time they run it, they take the other variable out. And uh, how does the learning process work? Uh, is that what you eliminate one by one the variables and see. What I'm not sure how the learning process works. I'm not sure what's the best way to uh, to train this uh, this kind of machine learning algorithm. Uh, mm -hmm. Something like that might be what's going on. Right, so they, they should be throwing everything inside the model, and then they might be training with the sigmoid function. 
with the one divided by one plus e raised to minus beta zero plus beta zero x one plus beta beta two x two like that. Means you throw all your variables inside the model, and then you train your logistic function with the, all the models, and you get the corresponding weights so out. But the model itself. It's basically going through every scenario. Yeah, right. So it will be like covering for the, all the scenarios. And then you take the logic of the function and then you try to predict the output, which is from the 0 to 1. Yeah. I mean, what they do also, like, like what, what, what's, what's the best thing to do to, to train the model? Depends on the amount of data that you have. Because uh, you, you cannot afford to examine too many combinations. You have a lot of data because it will take too long time. So, so you need to be smart. But I'm not sure exactly what, what I, I don't think they implemented that themselves. They, I'm pretty sure they just use like an off-the-shelf library for, for it's that. It's not a neural net or something? No, it's not a neural net. It's not. But it is probably there, are, it's, there is some math that's related to in some parts of it, but it's not a neural net. Um, so are you really using all this They, they just use logistic regression tools. So they don't consider alternate. They, con they, they do a lot of work mm -hmm. on which variables do they throw into the model, but they don't do much work into which model do they use. They just, just take this model. Uh, have you tried other classical like, uh, regression trees? I, I don't think they, do. they don't do that in the paper. And did the paper say why they chose logistic regression? I assume it's kind of a standard. I mean, I remember doing similar issues that before, and I just use logistic classifier because that was the easiest. And it kind of makes sense. Yeah. But you said they put a lot of care into which variables they put into the classifier. Yeah, yeah, I'll show a table. With uh, the variables, sort of effectively then manually selecting variables to put into the classifier to see which gives the best output rather than taking a selection of variables and running it through <coughs> machine intelligence or statistical things to find out which work best it's kind of a bit more brute force is that what you're saying they, they do it kind of by hand they do it kind of by hand i think uh, i i seen other well they do it kind of by hand but not quite because there is actually another paper that they cite where by brute force they or using using an algorithm. So there are three kind of actually they, they just classify variables into two kinds of variables. Uh, there is the Twitter variables, which are very few, and they are well very few. You have one for each word, but probably do you have the Twitter variables, which is the one that this paper is focusing on? Those basically there are three cases. One case is when they consider the Twitter uh, the Twitter frequency of the words, and they don't consider anything else. Another one is that when they consider the Twitter frequency of the words, and uh, they do that uh, linear reduction, and then they, sh then they throw some features about the performance on the teams. And then I think with the, with the rate of tweets, they also consider it by, the self by, the, by itself, and combining with some features about the performance of the teams. Those features about the performance of the teams they they try several options, but the combinations of options that they try are taken from a paper, which itself has an algorithm to look at which combinations of variables are best. So there is not complete arbitrary their, their choices of variables. They they took it from some paper that has an algorithm where they they try they they try to be smart about looking for sets of variables corresponding to the team's performances that can be used to predict. Does that answer the question, more or less? I'm sorry. I think so, yeah. yeah. So, um, the way the predictions are made is uh, it's in an online fashion. So basically, uh, they start in week four of the 2012 season because the first weeks of the season are thought to be kind of random. Uh, well, it's always random, but there's kind of weird stuff going on in the first week. So they start in week number four. And then they train the model for each week using data from the two previous seasons. And the, this 
current season uh, when they read the paper, which is 2012, up to three weeks before. So uh, the value of the input variables as well as the output of the games for all of those games are what they use to train their, their prediction model. And also, the, the prediction model has some parameters that are given to the training algorithm. So they just brute force what's the best value for those parameters, uh, such that the algorithm makes good predictions on the previous two weeks. That seems kind of ad hoc. I mean, it seems reasonable. You're kind of trying to adapt to local trends. Maybe you should choose it to maximize performance in, in the whole set. I don't know. But that's the way they do it. That's their, their training, their prediction, their training and prediction algorithm. Um, any question? Okay. So then I'm going to discuss uh, the results that they get. So basically, if we look at the predictions that they make about who's going to be the winner, many of them don't look that impressive because, uh, as I said, if you predict the home team is going to win, you're going to get it right 57% of the time. So if Twitter unigrams are giving you 52%, or if Twitter unigrams combine with the, the F, whatever, represent uh, information about the performance of the teams, except F1 and F2, that represent the, the spread and over under lines. So if you combine that information about the performance of the teams, uh, F something, with the Twitter uh, word, word frequency as one variable, and you get 47.6%. That's, like, that's, that's, that's not very nice. So, so I mean, I, I can understand why they use the Twitter rate variable, which does better after uh, So something else that, oh, also, as you can see, you can use the point spread line to see who is going to win. Who is going to win, the favorite. So if the point spread line is a, is a 50-50 proposition that a team will win by five or more, well, that team is going to win. Most likely, and you get that right sixty percent of the time. So that's, that's kind of kind of cool to see. That's a F one at the very top. So, and then there is something that kind of annoys me, which is they don't comp they don't put any noise levels on this. So let's forget for for the rest of of talking about this slide about the winner column. Uh, WTS, by the way, is with the spread. So it is the 50-50 spread prediction we've been talking about. So basically, here what we have is 32 predictions about events that are more or less 50-50. Right? You have like 16 al you have 16 algorithms and you're making predictions for two things each. So you have 32 series of doing predictions. So I think something that he useful to consider is let's assume that our algorithm didn't have any prediction power at all. Our algorithm just like threw a coin. Mm. And then and we have 32 runs of that algorithm that has no prediction power. Then what's the chance that one of the runs by luck actually gets a bunch of gains, right? So I made those numbers and hopefully they're right. So Basically, I think you're expecting to achieve 53.6% in 5.5 five of, 5 .5 of those runs, even if your algorithm has no prediction power. And you, we can see here how many get 53.6%. It's like 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So maybe I missed one, but like, it's kind of disappointing. And it would be, I mean, a lot of, I, I like the idea of using Twitter and whatnot, but it would be cool if they kind of acknowledge that. And, uh, and also how many are expected to, uh, to achieve 57.2% is like 0 0.8. And there are two that do it. So that's a little bit more, more optimistic. And something that stands out is that the best number tend to be the ones that use the Twitter rate, uh, the rate of tweets combined with some features about the team's performance. So 
that's just six predictions. <laughs> so the success that we see, that 58.2 and the 57.2, just for making these predictions, it may be worth looking more into. So, so that, 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 that one is a little bit better. But overall, the results are, I mean, again, for, for 50, at the 53.6 level, like, they're, they're not doing better than random. So that's kind of, that's kind of sad. Um, so something else that just kind of like winding, uh, winding down the, the, the presentation, a, a few things. So first, if anyone is wondering, OK, I'm going to implement the Twitter rate thing. And maybe if I, I, like, I, I get lucky, I'll make money. So some things that, that might make that kind of hard. So one is the market adjusting to information. This paper is not from yesterday. It's it has one or two years, maybe three. So the people that said those spread and over underlines, they, they read this paper too. So <laughs> they might have taken that into account into the way they said the lines. Or maybe not. Maybe they have other reasons that it's best for them to ignore this. But but there's a chance that they that, <coughs> that they took it into account. Um, second one is that these people are getting those spread and over underlines for NFL from NFLdata.com. Uh, sure, it's there, but that doesn't mean that, that that that's a snapshot from a website that's from a particular place at a particular time. Uh, those might be the spread lines that the that a particular bookmaker that you might not be able to bet at is giving just before the beginning of the game. Mm. If you are making a prediction, you're usually not making just before the beginning of the game or or whatever point the NFL data took the took the, the spread lines from. So it's, it's might be a different uh, a different mathematics for adjusting to the spread just before the game and for adjusting to the spreads one week before the game. Like, well, it's unclear. And then of course there is lag. There's a lot of lag involved in this kind of stuff. As We've seen in the previous case with the with the random coins. So, one more thing: um, if this talk was interesting, I saw that there is a course in EDX, a related thing. It might suck. It might not. <laughs> uh, I intend to start it. I thought people might might like it. Um, this is the name of the paper. Uh, the others. Um, I thought it would be cool to recommend uh, this tweet account. Twitter account. I think uh, it's not about NFL, but it's about the uh, well, it's about fun stuff. <laughs> but it's also about the uh, mark of uh, mark of chains. Uh, they have uh, I don't know if anyone has seen it here, but basically they combine uh, emails from recruiters for like software jobs with there is this other website, Colerowit. I don't know if anyone has heard of it. It's a website where people talk of their experiences with like uh, chemical compounds, and then they combine. It. So they basically look for like ways that you can make sentences that make sense, taking part of one, taking part of the sentence from a wit and taking the other one from an email from a recruiter, and it's it's really funny. So I like it. I can put it on the screen as well. Oh. Actually, I'll put it on the screen. So you don't have to look at your phone. So I don't know. I think I like this one. I think it's funny. They have a they have a lot of them. The, I like this one too. It's kind of simple. The vast parking lot of explaining. Guy, I hope you're in the hospital for the next couple of days. I will reach out. <laughs> That's kind of not. Oh, I like this one. Codating a state of categorical anxiety and directionless fear until 6 a.m. <laughs> Don't hesitate to reach out to see if you would like to set up a brief questionnaire and possibly linger in psychological difficulties. <laughs> oh, I like this one. A Stanford alumni, alumni with a large amount of psychedelic preparation, <laughs> extensive practice in meditation and identity control, and I'm a book. <laughs> Uh, this is the top. This is probably the best of all time. Moaning, holding ourselves, 
to quell the inner pain. We are experiencing incredible growth. <laughs> it's, it's very nice. So I'm actually it's very important. curious about why they use unigrams. Because I feel like, sorry, back to the video. Yeah, 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 that's uh, good, that's good. Uh, because I feel like a lot of information is lost yeah. in, in, in human speech with, mm -hmm. you know, like, with <coughs> words that negate meanings, for yeah, example. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the, 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 the very basic one. Or, or, you know, sarcasm or, I mean, you would probably get a lot more information there. And I think if you mind that, there's much more accuracy to be yeah, had. Yeah. And something I was thinking also was pronouns. Right. It's not the thing you say, we lost, yeah. then you just say, you lost. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it yeah. makes a big difference. Absolutely. So. They didn't really do any like sentiment analysis. Exactly. Right? So no, agree. no. So yeah. That's like the next level, right? You actually yeah, yeah, say yeah. how positive sentiment is. Yeah, I mean, you sh they are expecting that the sentiment will be inferred yeah. by the um, by the training algorithm. Right. They will expect that the uh, and it's reasonable, I guess, to assume that the the training algorithm will detect that the word injury in the tweets of people that follow our team right. is correlated with the team like not winning the next game. Yeah. But, but it's not strictly speaking, sentiment analysis. Type. But but yeah, it's just emergent thing that might happen, but they are, they are not being very, uh, they're not, it's not explicit at all. Yeah, that, that might be interesting to, to do as well. And, and I mean, about making money, I always feel like this is very interesting to do, but at the end of the day, if somebody's feeling about this, somebody else is thinking about it, that, that person probably can also knows that this team is going to lose or can also expect that, right? So yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing with the sports predictions is that The mark, how do I say this? There are both rational, uh, I know an expert in economics, but a way to phrase this that hopefully doesn't sound too stupid is there are both rational and irrational agents in this market. So you have people that are running these algorithms, yeah. and then you have a bunch of people that are making like best at 3 a.m. drunk. And those people also right. have, uh, they also can move the market. Right, of course. So, so I mean, that, that makes things a bit complicated. expectation would be that Twitter would probably be quite closely aligned with the prediction of the market in terms of the betting market because you know, I, I believe most of the bookmakers adjust based on how many people are making bets on either side mm -hmm. which is basically yeah, it's kind of like crowdsourcing mm -hmm. the answer and this is almost doing the same thing using Twitter so I'd imagine that generally the correlation between crowdsourcing of bets and the crowdsourcing of Twitter commentary is, it has a high degree of correlation, well a high degree of correlation in likelihood of being wrong just as much as likelihood of being right. I think the, the, the bookmakers reacting to supply and demand in the buying and selling is uh, possibly a, a lagging, maybe a lagging indicator, but what is, I think they're saying this could be a leading indicator of, of the performance before the and the bookmakers maybe one step behind the, <coughs> the leading indicator of s the social media. So so I, I cannot tell the thing that the bookmakers are just there and rich. It's like, why does it get some more? Why is it getting more popular? Yeah. And they are just the, the odds based on how much money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the so it's going to be interesting yeah. to see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why they're just yeah. to minimize yeah. their risk. Yeah. Right. So, so it's going to be interesting to see that actually plotted over time to see. If you have a graph of where the, the market is for a particular event as it nears D-Day versus this algorithm and how that plots it to see whether or not yeah, there is a time series lag or leap. Yeah. Uh, how much was the amount of the tweets, the numbers? Uh, was the number of tweets? Because that it matters also if you have like 10,000 or 10 million tweets, the algorithm will be... Might be on prediction. the paper. Might be on the paper, I see. Let's see if they have it. Uh, they will, They use large quantities. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, it's it's here. It's here. Uh, so pre-game, uh, and I think weekly is the one we're looking at. Anyway, it's on the hundreds of it's on the hundreds of thousands. I mean, you're dividing that between a few hundred games, but I think it's still it looks still more or less significant. Uh, yeah. 
any more more questions? So about Microsoft Teams, right? I think I think maybe <coughs> you should check out SideGen. Yeah, it, it was the classical Microsoft Chain algorithm that MIT used to um, automatically generate scientific paper and try and submit to various conferences. And we found out, I think, that the suckers were the philosophy conference. <laughs> and joined it. Side channel. Yeah. yeah. I was to use other like, ports because I couldn't afford it to write. I've actually read the uh, postmodern generator, which is based on the side channel. And it's actually quite believable. Yeah, and then it was in charts as well, charts and tables. <laughs> there, there were some after. Is that the 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 Sokal affair one? Yeah. Is that the one the the postmodern one? Yeah, the yeah, one? Yeah. 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 So there were a few people a few years up, like more recently than that, that actually got into some. Uh, they go into so into some confer I I I triple E conferences. I mean, they were like very sketchy I triple E conferences, <laughs> but they they got into them. Yeah, yeah. It's just nobody read. Right. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Just yeah pretty much. So, so were the predictions, I guess, I'm assuming they were done bef uh, before the game, the real game, and it wasn't like a back test where they uh, predicted on a back test? They only used previous data. So I don't know if they did it every week or they did it at the end of the season, but the predictions about a particular game ignore any data that happens in the future. I don't know if that's done because the prediction is actually made temporarily speaking before that data exists, or because they don't just take it into account. But it's done in an online fashion. But it's it not was done. made before the actual game took place. I don't know. I don't. Or was it all done in retrospect? Do you see what I mean? In a back test. Yeah. Well, the, even if it was done in a batch test, the prediction it, it shouldn't matter really. But Be you can overfit the data. Yeah. No, because you're ignoring the future data. So in train, like if you. If we look at the at what they do, either they did it every week or they simulated, because basically for every so the games happen week week one a bunch of games week two a bunch of games and so on. So what they do is okay, let's try to predict the games from week five, and then let's train our algorithms uh, using uh, data up to the previous week, up to what happened on week four, and then let's make our predictions. And then okay, now it's week six. Let's like train our model again using data up to week five, and then let's make our predictions for week six. If you do that at the end of the season, or you do it in each week, it shouldn't matter yeah. because if, you if you're not using anything past the, yeah. the game day, then yeah. yes, then it should be okay. Cool. Oh. There are no more questions. I will. Thank <laughs> you.